What is eternal security? Once saved, always saved? What's that? Knowing God's unbreakable promise of His eternal security to you, the believer, will be your steadfast assurance and grounding your mind in His Word, giving you His peace and tranquility. Double crust. All dressed pizzas, $41.99. Oh, I want a pizza. Me too. Me too. I want pizza. I want pizza. Uh, who put this menu over here? Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. So question for you, is it eternal security or conditional security? Because these are the two teachings that seem to be going around Christendom right now. Both are valid, by the way, depending on where you put them on God's timeline. Now I want you to understand Paul's salvation. There are many people who believe that salvation can be lost under the gospel of the grace of God. I don't know how they calculate that, but there's many, many people that believe that. They teach that you need to do works alongside your faith for you to be saved and to keep yourself saved. This type of salvation is devoid of all grace. You're doing all the work. One main passage that they like to go to is found in James. In James 2.24 it says, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified. Underline that. And not by faith only. That's pretty clear. Yet Paul taught in Romans 3.28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is this a contradiction? Absolutely not. James' letter was addressed solely to the Jews, not to the Pauline church while Paul's letters were directed to the church for their directives. Two distinct audiences, two distinct mandates, and two distinct judgments. When you make Israel and the church one and the same, that is Israel morphing or transforming itself into the church, only then do these two passages contradict themselves. And I've seen books upon books upon books trying to validate the works without faith. It doesn't make sense. Read the words the way that they're written. Everyone has their place on their own timeline. So by going to James 1.1, 1, 1, this is going to unconfuse everything I just finished saying. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. James is writing the letter to the Hebrews. He's writing the letter to Israel, to his countrymen. He is not writing to the church. This is what needs to be understood. And from this premise in verse 1, in James 1.1, 1, 1, when you get to chapter 2 and all the way through, he is talking to a specific audience. He is not talking to the church. Church. So James' works, quote-unquote, is aimed to the saints in the time of Daniel's 70th week and Revelation. This quote-unquote work becomes false doctrine for the saints in the Pauline church. The body of Christ is under the gospel of the grace of God. I don't care how you slice that cake. In the Pauline letters, where salvation is by faith only, will be false doctrine to James, Daniel's 70th week, and the Revelation saints. The tribulation saint is under the everlasting gospel found in Revelation 14.6 and this gospel is explained in verse 12, what that particular gospel, the everlasting gospel is. Now, can we divide the Bible in this way? Absolutely. You already divided the Testaments into an old and new. So you already have your first division right there. If you're very careful, you read the words on the pages, you're going to come to find out what the timeline is and to know where to put everything exactly. And by the way, your Bible is laid out in a linear fashion. You're going to notice that blindness in part happens in Acts chapter 7. What happens after Acts chapter 7? When they stoned Stephen, they say, we want nothing to do with you. Blindness in part happens. Paul comes out in Acts chapter 8. From Acts chapter 8 all the way up to Philemon, God uses Paul to go out there to the Gentiles and to add to the church that God started off in Acts chapter 2. Once we're raptured out of here, what's the book right after Philemon? It's Hebrews. It was a letter that was sent to the Hebrews. It was sent to Israel. All of a sudden you have James to the 12 tribes and you keep on going to Revelation 19. So from Hebrews to Revelation 19, you've got your seven years right in there. Once you properly divide where everything goes, your Bible is going to start making sense. And you desperately need it, especially now, because I'm finding that the false doctrines are climbing rampant on the walls. It is crazy. So 
Paul commanded believers to study and rightly divide the word when he wrote the second letter to a Timothy. And there was a reason why he told them that. Look at the mess that we're in. The mess already had started in Paul's day. And he goes, I want you to rightly divide the word. People are saying stuff that's not true. And we're going back 2,000 years. Now today, they basically sharpened everything. Everybody's got their doctrines. Everybody's got their verses. If it's in biblical context, then I'll sit down and I'm going to listen to what you have to say. For this particular study, I was looking at reasons why eternal security is a false doctrine. The verses that they were taking out of context, I'm thinking of just making a Bible study on the verses that they use and how out of context it is. Some of them they knocked out of the ballpark. Are these people for real? God gave you a brain, He expects you to use it. When examining the Pauline epistles, which serve as doctrine only for the church age saints, did you hear what I just said? It reveals the assurance of eternal security and salvation by faith alone. People go from Genesis to Revelation and they rarely hit the Pauline epistles. And when they do hit the Pauline letters, they're just taking stuff out of context. Question, how does one come to salvation during the dispensation of the grace of God? I know, I just swore. I used the word dispensation. Sorry. Many people become distorted when they hear the word dispensation. I've seen them, I've heard them, and I read about them. And I hope that you're not one of them. And if you are one of them that you just became like all stropiad, well, you know what? This next tidbit of information is basically going to be for you. From my heart to yours. What does Paul say in Ephesians 3, 2? If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. Now, side note. Was dispensations invented in the 1830s by John Darby? Absolutely not. He did not invent that. He did not invent that word. In 1382, John Wycliffe, an Oxford professor, produced the first handwritten English language Bible. In this verse, John Wycliffe used the word dispensation. This is approximately 450 years before Darby. And when they say there's nothing before Darby, prick up your ears because they're lying straight to your face. They lie like Persian rugs. So if you're told otherwise, just don't believe them. Let's get back. So when you come to the point in your life where you realize your state before God, that there is none righteous, no not one, and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You also come to understand how God manifested His great love for humanity, and it becomes evident for what He did specifically for you. And God through Paul said in Romans 5.8, But God commended His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And again, in Ephesians 2, 4, what does it say? But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Now, at this point, of course, John 3, 16 also comes to mind. But at this point, you're convinced of your sins towards God. And you confess in prayer with your mouth to the Father. What do you confess with your mouth? God, through Paul, tells you what to confess. In Romans 10, 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what you're confessing. Now, notice there's no addendums to any work attached to this salvation. Believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you get salvation. It's a gift of salvation, and I'll be proving it to you. And by the way, while I'm here, salvation is full, it's free, and it's for everybody. God did not pick and choose a few people. So basically all can come to God because it's basically in His promise. Verse 13, For whosoever, did you get that? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's not picking and choosing. The word if in verse 9 is what determines if you're part of the elect or not part of the elect. But that's another Bible study. So prayer is just speaking to the Father in your own words, telling Him of your transgressions towards Him. In your own words, confessing the Lord Jesus, believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and God promises you His salvation. The moment that similar words like these come out of your mouth from your heart is the moment you receive the gift of righteousness. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 5, start reading in verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore as by the offense of one, 
speaking of Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so the righteousness of one, speaking of Jesus, the free gift, did you see that? The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. My justification came from a free gift that I received, the gift of righteousness. That's why you cannot lose your salvation. It was something that was given to me, not something that I worked for to get it, to attain it, or I got it and now I'm working to actually keep it. That's heresy, that's false doctrine, when you're under the gospel of the grace of God. So what did you do to receive this salvation from the Lord, this free gift? Absolutely nothing. Through faith, you are saved by God's grace and not by any of your personal efforts. That's what you need to put in your little head. In Ephesians 2.8 it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Underline that. Highlight that. Put LEDs on and off, the lights on and off. Every time you come to Ephesians 2.8, you have to see those words. Not of yourselves. And yet you've got three quarters of Christianity working out their salvation, holding it on their back, and they're working so they can keep it. Where are you going in life? Not of yourselves. What Bibles have you been reading? It's the gift of God, not of works. I repeat, not of works lest any man should boast. This is what God is speaking through Paul when he penned those words down. In this context, the pivotal word here is quote-unquote grace, which refers to unmerited, undeserved favor and kindness of God. It signifies God's goodwill and benevolence extended to humanity, not based on our own efforts, on the works that we produce. The verse emphasizes that salvation is a gift from God, granted by His grace and received by you through faith in Jesus Christ. It underscores the idea that our salvation is not something that we earn or achieve on our own. Rather, it's the result of God's gracious initiative. Paul specifically communicated this to the church. So what did Paul communicate? In Titus 3, 5, look at the words, underline it, highlight it. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. How can you lose something that was given to you? But according to His grace, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, in this context, the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, refers to the spiritual transformation and renewal that believers experience through the indwelling and the work of the Holy Ghost. Again, it's nothing that you did to receive of this salvation. Go back up a couple of verses in verse 3. For we ourselves were, past tense, sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Look at verse 4. But after that, this is when we came out of the world, this is how we were. But after that, what happened? The kindness and love of God, our Savior towards man, appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. I want you to go to Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I repeat that. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. What brings salvation? It's the grace of God. Not the filthy works that you can actually do from your flesh. What work could you do that God's going to say, I am super proud of you? Titus 3.6. Which He, speaking of God, shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So this type of giftified or graced righteousness is found only through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's a gift. It's a grace that He's given given us, we didn't deserve it, yet He gives it to us in all our filthiness. Verse 7, being justified by, underlying this, His grace. It's His grace that saves us, not the works that you're trying to attain salvation. Not your works that you're trying to keep salvation. Not works because you lost it and now I'm going to do a good work for me to get it back. It was a gift that He gave you. If you're working for it, it's not grace anymore. You're actually paying for your salvation. And there's nobody that's going to get up there in heaven to say, I got here because my good works. Blow it out your ear, buddy. This passage emphasizes salvation by God's grace, not by your human works. And the transformative work of the Holy Spirit symbolizes the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. It suggests a cleansing and renewal of the believer's inner being. There's a work happening on the inside of us, marking a new spiritual birth and life in Christ. Now this salvation you have was given to you as a gift. And as you will see, it's a work God did where you can't boast. Look at what I did to get myself into heaven. It doesn't work like that. I've been humbled when I came to the Lord. 
Lord, Lord, forgive me a sinner. Give me of this gift of eternal life. And I know that there's nothing, nothing, even after I'm saved, that I can do that I can even please you. Our works is like a filthy rag. So it's a work that God did and where we can't boast to get it or even keep it. And you think that you can keep your salvation by doing works? I don't know where you got that from. I would like to see a chapter and verse on that. Do you think that you can regain your salvation by a filthy little work that you've done? Think again, who are you kidding? Maybe your grandmother, yeah, maybe she would be, yeah, yeah, your grandmother. At the moment you receive the gift of righteousness is the precise moment you receive your spiritual circumcision. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of sins of the flesh of the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the opera operation of God, underline that, who hath raised him from the dead. There's an operation, a spiritual operation, a spiritual circumcision that went on. And there's no work that you could have done for this to actually happen in you, your life, your mind, your soul. Only the Lord could have done that. Again, it's the operation of God, not you. He did it. Next, at this precise moment, after you finish praying those prayers to God, you are spiritually baptized into the body of Christ, of which Jesus is the head. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul said, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. It's something spiritual. There's no water involved over here. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. It's at this particular moment, after you finish praying that prayer, not only were you baptized, not only were you circumcised, what happens at that same second? You receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, whereby you are at this moment sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And it's at that moment that the guarantee is given to you for the salvation that God's already given you. Let's look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 45. And they of the circumcision, speaking of the Jews, Israel, which believed were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured the gift of the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And here comes the guarantee. In verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. So as Noah Webster defined, and I quote, This sense of the word, word earnest is primary, denoting that which goes before or in advance. Thus the earnest of the Spirit is given to saints as a pledge or assurance of their future enjoyment of God's presence and favor, this sealing of the Spirit nowhere else is found in the Bible. When you get to Revelation, the church is gone. Yeah, but what about Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3? That is not the Pauline church. Why don't you read the characteristics of those churches? They're all works-based. There's nothing in there that Paul ever pointed to and said that we have to do. Also, when you pray that prayer, it's at this precise moment that you become a child of God and not a second before. So where do I get this? In John 1 12 it says, but as many as received him, the moment you pray, the moment those words come out of your mouth from your heart, not from your head, from your heart. You know how many people are going to be missing heaven by 18 inches? There's about 18 inches between your head and your heart. So when you pray and you speak from your heart and you pray that prayer, I believe in Jesus Christ that he is Lord. He resurrected from the dead. I believe in his resurrection. It's at that moment that you become a child of God. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now why did I give you all this info for? Many people do not understand the gospel of the grace of God. You also have got the gospel of the kingdom, you've got the everlasting gospel. They are not the same gospels, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry to bust your bubble on that one. Because of false teachers and preachers, many believers are oblivious to the salvation facts which I just laid down. And by the way, it's in your Bibles. You don't need me. If you would be reading your Bibles on a daily basis, you'd be meditating on God's Word. This stuff is just going to start coming to you. The Holy Ghost is going to guide you into all truth. So these preachers and teachers, they're teaching these people, and the people, speaking about you, they're oblivious to some of these facts. Distorting the knowledge of God's salvation, that is by adding works to get it, 
to keep it. You lost it. I'm going to get it back. That has nothing to do in the Pauline epistles. You are going to find this doctrine from Genesis to just before Jesus Christ died. And also after the church will be raptured from that moment to Revelation 19. Working your salvation, losing it and getting it back. That's going to be at that time. Make sure that you're putting it in the right timeline. So under the gospel of the grace of God is the only time in scripture where righteousness is given as a gift and your salvation is based on God's operation, not your operation. This type of salvation by works was necessary for the Old Testament saint and will be necessary for the tribulation saint and for them to be in good standing with the Lord. Once you understand this, your Bible starts making more sense. Psalm chapter 7 and verse 8. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness. Why is it that when we're reading in the Pauline epistle, Epistles, it's his righteousness, it's his gift, it's his operation. All of a sudden now it's my righteousness? Because in the Old Testament, you committed a crime, you committed a sin, you had to come to the temple, bring in your sacrifices for you to be atoned. And then finally the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, finally shows up on the scene. And he was the end of my righteousness because I'm putting my faith and trust in him. Here's another one for you. What about Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 14? Though these three men... Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. Where did they get this righteousness? They had to work for it, saith the Lord God. In 1 Samuel chapter 26 and verse 23 it says, The Lord rendered to every man his righteousness. This is speaking differently than the way Paul is speaking in his letters to the church. So to finish the verse, and his faithfulness. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 32, start reading there. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. The next verse is very interesting. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And that's the transgression of God's law, His commandment. Whatever God spoke, you went against it. Sin is the transgression of the law. The minute you transgress, your name is taken out of that book. Go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12 now. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. God just finished saying to Moses in Exodus, those that have sinned against me, I'm going to blot out, I'm going to erase. I'm going to cut them out of my book. It's going to end up at the judgment. And this is where your works are going to be judged. I just gave you a few verses in the Old Testament where it's your righteousness that you're actually working out. What happens when we get to the times of Jesus, the scribes and Pharisees? What did Jesus say? Always in continuance with this righteousness work. In Matthew 5.20 it says, For I say unto you, Jesus speaking, that except your righteousness, the works that you do, shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's no sealing of the Holy Ghost going on in what Jesus is saying. There's a work that has to be performed. Their hearts, they were so far away. But the works were perfect. Your works had to be more than the scribes and Pharisees. To walk super straight, never to look on a woman to lust after her. Never to steal something, not even a paper clip. Not even to steal time. You got 10, 15 minutes of break and you're taking 20 minutes for a break. You're stealing 5 minutes off of your boss. He's paying you for something that you stole. So Paul is making the case for the gospel of the grace of God. Turn with me now to Romans 4.4. 4. We'll start reading there. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. If you're working, it's not grace, it's not an unmerited favor, you're meriting it by you working for it, but you're working out of debt. So if you produce a work, it's not grace anymore, you're paying for that particular debt. Verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The believer's faith will be counted as a work. So when you prayed that prayer and you believe from your heart in the death, barren, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the work that Jesus Christ, that God is actually imputing in you. Verse 6, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose inequities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. How can the Lord not impute sin? Because somebody already took your place and His righteousness now is imputed in you. His righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed in you. This is the gift that He's given you. 
How can you lose a gift? How can you work to keep this gift? How can you work to actually acquire this gift? If you work for it, it's not a gift anymore. This is what you need to understand. What about what Paul said in Romans chapter 10 verses 4 and 5? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things, you're working them out, shall live by them. So if you're working, there's any work involved between you and God, you have to keep the whole law. The minute you slip on one, you're guilty of all of it. So here under the gospel of the grace of God, God does the work for you, thus it's a gift that He presents to you. Now question, what did you do to be saved? Absolutely nothing. As Paul said in Romans chapter 5 verses 17 and 18, it's the gift of righteousness. If God imputed this work and righteousness in you, what could you possibly do to keep or even get the salvation? Ask yourself this question and make sure that you give yourself an answer. It's a gift, meaning that you did no works to receive this particular salvation. We are all pieces of unrighteous filth. And in that state that we come to God, we are all taken in by the Lord and adopted as soon as His righteousness is imputed in us. At that moment you pray those words, all these things are happening in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. This is what's happening to you. You might not feel it, but on a spiritual level, this is exactly what's happening. Understanding the salvation prerequisites under Paul's gospel of grace will settle the believer's mind. It's going to settle your mind in confident assurance of your salvation which is given in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14 you've got the earnest you've got the guarantee in 2 Corinthians 6 1 it says this we then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain the grace of God which is freely given to us for salvation the gospel is received in vain when it's received without genuine faith when it fails to impact one's beliefs and actions. What works have you done to receive your salvation except speaking words from your mouth and believing from your heart? Which other works were needed under the gospel of the grace of God? That's right, there were no works whatsoever that was needed. If we do any kind of works, it is no more grace that saved us, but a debt that we are actually paying off. And this is what Paul is actually debating in his letters. If you think that you can lose your salvation, what makes you think that you're going to get it back? It was given as a gift, and what work do you think that you can perform to actually regain it? If you think that you can lose your salvation, you don't understand grace. The righteousness that you are working out, that is, out of your own efforts, your self-righteousness, that was needed in the Old Testament, i just give you a few verses there. This is what everybody is writing on today. This is the mentality they have. Get your head out of the Old Testament righteousness works mindset, and get yourself under the gospel of the grace of God. This is what's screwing up the church. It takes one person to rot the brains of 100, 200, 1,000 people sitting in their congregations because the 100, 200, 1,000 people sitting in their congregations will not take the time to go out and check out to see if the preacher is right. It's so nice here. I got all my friends over here. He's leading you to hell. If you're doing any kind of works, you're not understanding Paul, you're not understanding God, and you're not understanding the message that he's given to you. In Romans chapter 10 verse 3 it says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, I'm going to separate something here, are going about to establish their own righteousness. You have your own righteousness and you've got God's righteousness having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You're going about establishing your own righteousness. Why don't you turn around and says, let me put myself under the righteousness of God. This is what Paul is saying to the believers in Rome. Verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness are going about to establish their own righteousness. The second that you're trying to do a work to get it, to keep it, because you lost it, you want to get it back, you are not under God's righteousness. That's why you cannot lose that salvation. It's something that He gave you. You were sealed, signed, and you were delivered, and He gave you the guarantee. Verse 5, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. So Moses is explaining that the man that doeth those things shall live by them. So Paul continues to say in verse 8 that salvation is in your mouth and it's inferred not by your deeds. 
Jump down to verse 8 now. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all, unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the foundation that Paul laid for you, the believer. I got a question for you. What work, thought or word or action can you do to lose the free gift of salvation? Whatever you're going to give yourself, make sure it's in biblical context. One time a guy got me on one verse in Romans chapter 3. The answer was in Romans chapter 1. I had to go back two chapters to get the context of the last verses of chapter 3. A context is not two verses before and two verses after. Sometimes you might have to go back a couple of chapters to see the case that Paul or whoever is speaking is actually making. Whatever verse or passage you're going to be pulling out of the Pauline letters, again, you make sure that you got them in the right context. These following questions that I'm going to be asking you are asked in Pauline context, meaning asked in connection to the gospel of the grace of God. So here goes. What work can you do to erase or cover a bad one? Think about it. What work can you do to redeem yourself under the Pauline letters, under the gospel of the grace of God? What work can you do to be brought back into God's graces? What work can you do to keep your salvation intact? The idea today is that you can lose this gift. Produce your proof and context with the Pauline letters. I keep going back to that. If you're not convinced, I can't help you. You don't understand? Pray. Lord, open my eyes. Show me. Ask questions. The answers will come. People don't know the actual meaning of the word gift or grace and the God that actually gave it. It's either grace or it's works. It can be both. Romans chapter 11 verse 6 says, And if by grace, then it is no more works. He just split it down the middle here. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, if you guys are going to be working for it, it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. This is the basis of the gospel of the grace of God, which the apostle Paul preached to the church, to the world. The second you produce any kind of work to get saved, stay saved, to be saved, you fall from grace. In Galatians 5.2 it says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If you produce a work, Christ profits you nothing. The work that he did on the cross is a big fat zero. You just shoveled a massive hole in water. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You're going to do a work, you better keep doing those works and you better pump them out pretty good. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. What does it mean when you fall from grace? God says, there's nothing that you have to do. I'm going to be holding you up. No, God, let me help you here because I think you might have a bit of a problem there. I'm going to produce a bit of work so together we should do something. Are you out of your mind? Where are you coming from? What churches are you in? Get out, please. For your sake, not mine. I already ran out of a whole bunch of them. Verse 5, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Eternal security is found in God's promises through Paul's preaching. The Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I want you to watch this three minute video to secure your salvation. Whew, Lord, thank you for the words you've given me. Pray that the Lord keep us, bless us, and that he brings everybody safely here next week, here, there, or in the air.